Welcome to this special virtual Monday Thursday worship experience. We are blessed to have five congregations from our Montgomery County community worshiping together. Tonight we begin the Tritium, or the Great Three Days, which includes Monday Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. Together these three days are the Christian Passover. And as part of the Tritium, Tonight's worship is not a liturgy that has a beginning and an ending. Rather, tonight's liturgy is the beginning of a three-day liturgy that culminates with the great Alleluia's on Easter morning. You will notice that there is no benediction this evening. This is because the liturgy of the great three days will continue with tomorrow's Good Friday liturgy and Saturday evening's Easter vigil, and will include with and we'll conclude with the benediction and dismissal on Easter morning. The word Maundy in Maundy Thursday means mandate or commandment. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. On this day, Christ the Lamb of God gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. On this day, Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. On this day, Christ took a towel and washed his disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do unto others as he has done to us. Let us now worship together. Speak, Lord for your children are listening, for a word of encouragement, for a word of instruction about how we ought to live in these troubled times. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening as we drift off to sleep in our homes, even as we know there are neighbors who are sleeping on dusty floors or even outside. We are listening, Lord, rich and poor. We are listening, Lord, young and old, for a word from you that will heal us and heal our lands and our world. Eternal God, lover of souls, we come to you hungering for your word that will change the rest of our lives. We come hungering to you for honesty and generosity instead of greed. We come hungering to you for our neighbors to be fed and for all to have the basic needs of their families met. We come hungering, we come listening. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. Amen. Let us pray together in the words that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Nope. Oh, hi. I'm out here in my yard trying to see if any of my rocks can talk. Nope, not so far. I know it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but do you know that at one time rocks almost got to talk? Yeah. It's true, happened a long time ago when Jesus was still on earth. Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem and when the people found out that he was coming, they started praising God and worshiping him. They had palm leaves and they had, 
their coats and they put them down on the ground in front of where Jesus was going and were waving the palm leaves and they were praising God and saying, glory in the highest, peace in the highest, glory to God. They were worshiping God. <clears throat> but the chief priests, the pastors, the ministers, they didn't like that. So they said, tell these people to shut up. And Jesus said, if these people are silent, then the rocks would talk. The rocks would talk. They would be the ones praising God if the people couldn't do it. Well, fortunately, the people didn't stop praising God. So the rocks didn't have to talk, but they almost got to. The people were all worshiping God. They were bringing glory to God. They were glorifying God and that's a very good thing. Jesus also had told his disciples, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love those around you just as I have loved you. Jesus had loved the disciples and they had seen it. And now Jesus wanted them to love those around them as well. Well, how do you love people around you? Well, it's one thing to just say, I love you but it's more than just saying it, it's doing it as well. You can be of service to other people. You can help them out. Now I know that at this time we're not supposed to get out and be with people for a while, but there are other ways you can be of service, that you can love them. You could write somebody a note or a card or, or give them a picture that you've drawn. You could help them around their house, picking up sticks in their yard maybe even getting into their garden and pulling out some of the weeds. Those would be some of the ways that you can help, that you can be of service to them. And when you do that, you will glorify God too. And that would be a good thing as well. You can talk to your mom and dad and they can help you figure out some more ways that you can show love to those around you. The same way that Jesus shows love to you. Oh yeah. And if you're out working in somebody's garden, keep an eye out for their rocks. Maybe they have the ones that can talk. Our scripture for tonight's service comes from the book of Exodus chapter 12, verses one through four and 11 through 14. So listen now for God's word as it speaks to you. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I shall pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was a time of plague. The mightiest nation on earth had been shaken to its core and brought to its knees by an unexpected turn of events in which everything changed. But in the midst of unimaginable pestilence, despair, and fear, a group faithfully gathered. 
not in one place, but in their individual homes, on one fateful night, looking to God, who they trusted was coming to deliver them from death and save them all. The Hebrew people, captive under a merciless Pharaoh, yearned to be free. And God heard their cries. God sent Moses to tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. The Hebrews could have given up, but they did what God through Moses told them to do. They gathered for the first Passover meal, which marked the end of their oppression and the beginning of their journey to be free. The instructions were odd. Eat some mutton, smear lamb's blood on the door. Eat fast with bags packed, ready to go, because the salvation of God was at hand. It is a time of plague. The mightiest nation on earth is shaken to its core and brought to its knees by an unimaginable turn of events that have changed everything. But in the midst of all this unimaginable pestilence, despair, and fear, a group has faithfully gathered, not in one place, but in our individual homes, on this faith-filled night, looking to God, who we trust is coming to deliver us from death, and to save us all. The people of the world captive under the merciless coronavirus yearn to be free. We yearn to be free. And God hears our cries. God is coming. God shall save us. So tonight, Christians around the world are doing what God through Christ tells us to do. We remember the Passover meal that Christ transformed with these words, do this in remembrance of me. Eat this bread, drink this cup. By the breaking of my body on Calvary, your slavery to sin is broken. By the pouring out of my blood, not upon a door, but atop a cross, your captivity to death is done. Your journey with me begins. You're with me now. You are free. The instructions are odd. Eat a piece of bread that doesn't look much like bread or taste much like bread. Drink a dash of juice or wine. Remember a savior who came to save the world, but who the world rejected and tortured and killed. Follow a crucified carpenter and his upside down countercultural ways. Forgive 70 times seven, really? Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you. Give generously to anyone who asks anything from you. If you wanna be first, put yourself last. Love God, in fact, love everyone. If you wanna live, Take up your cross and follow me. The symbol, the sign, the reminder, and the reality of this life is a meal where everyone shares, where everyone has a place at the table, and where everyone who is hungry is fed. If that isn't challenging enough, John's gospel has Jesus washing the disciples' feet, telling us, to do the same. The two actions Jesus gave us to do in his name this night is a meal that teaches us to share and an example that teaches us to serve. These odd demanding instructions make smearing blood on your door and wolfing down mutton with your suitcases packed and your running shoes on seem downright sensible and way easier. Nonetheless, what Jesus gave us this night and what Jesus tells us to do this night is the way that leads to life. It's the roadmap Jesus gives us to get out of hell. 
It's the blueprint of how to be in this world, but not of this world. As we follow the crucified and risen one who has conquered the world and who will save us. None of us expected to be in a pandemic. Most of us, most of the time, delude ourselves thinking, I don't need to be saved. But the Bible and today's headlines tell us we do. We need a savior. The most radical thing you can do is to believe that you have a savior. The most radical thing you can do is to act like you have a savior. Believe that God is who God is supposed to be. Believe that God's going to do what God's supposed to do and live your life accordingly. And if you find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, know that your good shepherd is on the job. Trust that his rod and his staff will comfort you. They will deliver you. They will defend you. Communion or not tonight, God still prepares a table before us in the presence of any and all our enemies. God anoints us with oil. Our cup runneth over because Jesus poured himself out. That is the extent to which you are loved. That is the means by which we are saved. And that is the God who is working now to establish us all in life. Trust that. Give thanks for that. Live that. Share that. God will prevail. And you shall live. Good evening. As we gather this evening as people of faith, we gather with confidence in God's abundant mercy that we've come to know together in Jesus Christ. Because of our faith and trust in that, let us examine ourselves and confess our sin. Join me, will you, in bowing your heads in a prayer of confession. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we fail too often to courageously seek and fulfill your will. Though you in sacrificial love have bound yourself to us, still we fail to bind ourselves to you. In Jesus Christ, you serve us freely and save us by your grace alone. But we refuse your love. We insist on our own way too often and withhold ourselves from others in the world that you so love. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to live into the fullest measure of what it means to be fully human, made in your image. We put our efforts into our own personal salvation over communal care and transformation denying that it is your grace alone that compels us to live beyond our own interests. We confess, Lord God, that we often fail to love with all that we have and are, often because we don't fully understand what loving means, often because we're afraid of the risk that love requires. Oh Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we create barriers of division we build walls of pride and power ahead of planting seeds of hope through humility and deep listening and the empowerment of others. We confess, Lord God, that by silence and ill-considered word, words we have built up walls of prejudice and that by selfishness and lack of sympathy we have stifled generosity and left little time to care for others and sometimes even ourselves. O oh, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to listen to your word of forgiveness, for so often we turn our ears to other things. Come, fill us this moment 
and free us from our sin. Let us now be assured of God's grace. The good news in Jesus Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our own needs, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is a strange time, a time when we all long to be together, but we can't. A time when any communal act would feel like such a great, wonderful thing. A time when I wanna shake hands and hug people and I'm not much of a hugger. I wanna go on a walk and not think, is that person six feet away? And then we come to this evening, this Maundy Thursday, this night that Jesus gives the great commandment, the night that we are supposed to remember to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And he washes feet as a sign of his servanthood. And he invites everyone to wash everyone's feet. And so for years and generations, the church keeps doing this. And as a kid, I remember thinking, oh man, I was in confirmation class and my pastor required that we had our feet washed to finish confirmation class. And it was gross and I didn't like it. Now, some say that washing your feet is something countercultural and different and makes you feel vulnerable and all those things are good and all those things are healthy and all those things are good for us to understand that our faith life should be us acting vulnerably and should be us coming out of our comfort zones. But I feel like sometimes foot washing can be a bit of an easy out because I don't like it, but it gets over pretty quickly. And because I don't walk through the desert and don't have a whole bunch of gross stuff crunched up onto my gross sandaled feet, it's not really much of a task. It's a little stinky, but many of us pay a lot of money to have our feet look nice. It's a little different. Foot washing in Jesus' time was a symbol of hospitality. It was something a servant did, somebody lowly, way down the totem pole so that the person who was actually hosting the meal and hosting a guest could have the person walk in and feel welcome. So maybe wash your feet tonight. Maybe wash one another's feet. Some families, this might be quite an interesting ritual and it would be a good giggly time. And maybe if you are like me and you're just going outside with no shoes on because whatever, maybe you need it. But the other option I think is more interesting to ponder. What would be foot washing now? If Jesus was sitting with his disciples, self-quarantined in some little room, and they were all, of course, six feet apart with coughing Judas off in the corner, what would Jesus do to show hospitality? Would Jesus make a fool of himself and put on a mask as he went out to get the elements to make communion? Because if he might be a little bit sick, maybe he could get someone else sick, and though he's gonna look crazy when he goes, Maybe that would be his act of hospitality and servanthood. Would he sanitize everybody's hands and feet? Maybe. Would he spend hours scrubbing the whole room, floor to ceiling first, because in fact Judas was coughing and we don't want anyone else to get it? Or what else might he do? Something vulnerable, something yucky, something no one's gonna write a blog post about and no one's gonna clap and cheer about because there's a lot of people out there doing wonderful servant things in this world and they are so wonderful. But every act of servanthood in this time, every act of servanthood in any life matters. Showing love for your community, showing love for your neighbor, that's one of the things we are commanded to do. So I invite you, think about it. What could you do that's not just washing feet? Though you can do that too, if you like. What is an act of service you and your family, you and your abilities and your vulnerabilities allow you to participate in? Many of our food pantries have folks who are far over 65 doing all the service. Are you a young person who's healthy, who could help? So 
I invite you this evening, wash your feet. Wash your hands and do all the singing for 20 seconds that you need to do. And think deeply about the fact that our God came and made everything different. He turned everything upside down. He said the lowly are going to be lifted up. The first shall be last, the last shall be first, and the grungiest, grubbiest job in the world matters if it's done in love for another person. So get out your basins and wash your toes and then think about what Jesus would do tonight in your home to make it hospitable for those in need. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you have walked with us on our Lenten journey. You have been with us as we encountered each barrier and obstacle. And it is by your guidance and help that we have overcome so much. We have been strengthened by you. And now we give thanks that you have brought us together as one. Nourish our souls and spirits by your love that having been empowered and inspired by your example, we may go into the world to serve, heal, and welcome all people. In your holy name that we pray, amen.